Hello again everyone, welcome back to my new series on French Defense. Last week we talked about an opening that is pretty old but ultra aggressive that it can pretty much use to surprise your opponent when black plays knight to f6 in this variation in French Defense. Now as well it can go bishop to g5 pinning the knight to play pawn to e5 next move so bishop to e7 pretty much force, e5 attacking the knight, knight to d7 again pretty much force. In this variation normally we take on e7 as conventional French goes but this time we're not going to go conventional, we go pawn to h4. This one is a pretty old line, but it can serve to surprise your opponent. And again, the idea is that after the bishop takes and the queen takes, we can tempo the knight with multiple moves. One of them is knight to h3, and the queen will have a limited square to go to and to be considered safe. Now, because this is a review game, I'll be short and concise, but if you want full detail on the opening, you can always head on to the link on the description below that can lead you on to the playlist that I made last week about the French defense. Um, the specific variation. But in any case, this game is referenced from 1940s from the famous German Grandmaster Ludwig Parkman. His opponent, someone that I don't recognize, plays queen to h6. Again, we mentioned in the last video that queen to h6 might not be the best square for all black to go to and can already be considered a mistake from black. For a reminder, the theory was queen to h4, pinning down the knight to the rook. But anyway, queen to h6. As the development progresses, you can see that black has only two pieces developed out while well, white has already 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, the rook on h1 is considered developed because it's on the open file. He has 5 pieces developed versus 2 from black. So though being down a pawn, white is already in a good spot to claim an advantage here due to the very quick development from white. To add salt to the wound, white can already play knight to b5, or knight to d6 check, and hinders black from castling right. Also, they can aim at c7 square, forking the king and the rook, so this is already very good. But pawn f4 plate, after pawn takes d4, knight b5, king d8 to protect the c7 square from the fork. But already from here you can see the severe lack of development that comes to bite black when white plays knight to g5, sacrificing a rook, giving him his second one. Normally this should be winning in a game because you're up two rooks and two pawns. However, none of black's pieces can actually cope with the upcoming attack after knight takes f7 check, king to e7, queen g5 check. So it's a barrage of check that black can even stop with his pieces. And just after this move, bishop to e2 is a checkmate. The king is trapped in the corner of the board, and white was able to win just in 24 moves. So already you can see the fatality of this opening. If black doesn't move his pieces to the correct square, although he's up a pawn, he can be in a huge trouble. And this can be used as a surprise factor for opponent, as most intimate player doesn't know the concept yet. If you want to see more crushing example, this one is perfect. This one is between Gary Kasparov and Viktor Korchnoi, Viktor Korchnoi being one of the world championship challenger and Gary Kasparov presumably one of the best champion there is, battling it out with the French defense that we talk about with white playing a Lacan chat variation with pawn to h4. Now as per people in 1990s, they still take on g5 twice and call white's position a bluff being up a pawn. But after queen to d3 from Gary Kasparov which is one of the replies available, we also see Viktor Korchnoi not being able to handle pressure moving his queen back to g6. Now the conventional advice for people is that if you up a material, you want to exchange as many pieces and pawns as possible to simplify the game and to win the game easily. But one should remember that black in this position is down a couple of tempos. And so after the exchange from white, Gary Kasparov played knight to b5 again, the move that we talk about again and again, attacking the c7 square comes to bite black. The best move seems to be queen to e7 and after knight to b5, you can play knight to f8 or knight to b6, in which the queen protects c7 square dearly. But still, in this position, we don't have to go knight b5 to attack c7. We can go and take on e7 with our rook. And after the rook takes, the queen takes, the queen infiltrate on the king's side. The position will be slightly better for white, and we gain our pawn back. On top of that, we have um, quick development as well. Bishop to d3 can come, bishop b5 can come. We can cast on the queen side quickly, and bring our rook to the h-file to checkmate black on the other side of the board. So already on move 9, we can see that black is being very uncomfortable and in the end decided to play queen to g6. Forgot that he's down development, Gary Kasparov is delighted to exchange the pieces and play knight to b5 attacking c7. Black if he wants to can play king to d8, but the same problem occurs after knight to g5 attacking f7 square as well, this would be a fork. Rook f8 can come to protect f7 square, however knight to e6 is still a fork and will win the rook next turn. So Korshnoi kind of screwed, right? He plays king to e7 and after the pawn takes, I believe we don't need to show the rest of the game as white just screws over black's king side and in the end goes over to checkmate black in a beautiful fashion. 
This is awesome. We can win games in literally just 27 moves if we're playing people that hasn't been made aware of this concept just yet. And apparently, as I know it, there are a lot of intermediate players that does not know this effect and or concept. And so all the more reason that we can use this kind of opening to surprise Black. Now fast forward to 2015, this game is in the Tartar Steel tournament, played between Maxime Vachelograf and Ho Yi Fan, two of the most elite players also battling out in the kind of chartered variation. Now what's different is variation is that in 2015, nobody plays bishop to g5 anymore because of the risk that it carries, right? So people play pawn to h6 nowadays, forcing the matter on white's hand to exchange. We talked about this in the last video as well. If white wants to, he can bring his bishop back, but this will be suboptimal. And so normally bishop takes e7, and after queen takes on e7, our video concludes that pawn to f4 just striking on the center of the board and on the king's side, perhaps will have gotten us a better way prospect than focusing all our attack on queen side. But again, the engine in 2015 is different. The meta at the time was knight to b5, attacking the c7 square. And, you know, black has to play knight to b6 to protect it. And after this continuation, as you can see, black's bad bishop is still trapped behind a pawn chain. It's not easy to get out. But in general, that will be the game plan for black is to attack on a queen side, but white will be trying to focus all these pieces on the king side of the board. Additionally, we want to take on d4 and use the open c file to basically try um, to create counterplay on a queen side. And the game continues with pawn takes d4 castle, and after castle, pawn to f6 challenging the center of the board, which is a fine move. This is also a fine move to play after, let's say, the pawn takes on f6, rook takes on f6, and the rook will control the f file, the open f file, and that will be another avenue for black to attack on. And the game continues in that fashion, and black looks to solve the problem of black's bad bishop with pawn to e5 breaking on the center of the board, creating a mass exchange, but as an end result, the bishop can now go out, and she can basically consider the position fine over here. But if you were to cut the position deeply, we'll have noticed that black has an isolated queen pawn that we can target our pieces. Black also has his queen aiming at b2 pawn that is currently undefended, and so that would be the general game plan for white and black from now on, is to attack the weak pawns that each side have on the base. And so you see that, right? You see Maxime Vachelograph playing queen b3, attacking the pawn on d5, and also the knight here on b6, unprotected. The queen has to come back to d6, protecting the knight. Although here, queen f6 is possible attacking h4 pawn, but black can't really take it, right? Because the knight is hanging. We can start with knight to c2, um, knight to e3, and so on. And so queen to d6 might be a better move to offer d5 pawn extra protection, also protecting the knight here on d6. Now, Maxime Vachelograph plays a very practical move that I like, queen to c2. The idea is not other than playing queen to c7, trading queens, and after this, if Ho Yi Fan were to exchange, the rook will come to a c7, controlling the entire summit rank. This would be another advantage to look forward to. I'll bet that winning probably provides some practical chances for white to win the game. Keep pressing and to win the game. Now, Ho Yi Fan does not try to place queen to f6. This is also viable, again, as we talk about attacking the pawn on b2 that is weak from white's side. The problem for Ho Yi Fan's this position is that after queen takes b7, she went on to play rook h to b8, attacking the queen first. Now, I realize all these grandmasters are really good in feeling the nuance of the position. Often, the difference between most of us and the elite is the fact that they understand the shift of the win and right along with it. I mean, Yifan was just, you know, attacking the queen with the rook and lining up on the open file. Pretty logical, um, protecting the knight extra as well. But this is just a tempo that Maxim Vachelograph needs to win the game or to at least gain a considerable amount of advantage. He plays queen to c7, and after queen takes b2, the problem is queen to d6. The knight is protected, and it's no longer attack. Um, the next plan will be rook to b1 to again attack the knight on b6 instead. Now, Ho Yi Fan has to move the queen, she knows that, but she also understands she cannot move it to d4 due to the fact that she saw knight to c4 in this position. This is just another x clan. The point is, after knight takes c4, bishop takes c4, you can't really take, but on top of that is the bishop on d7 hanging and the threat of bishop takes on d5 check, taking the rook on a8 next. So this must be losing for black, and so black does not go into that. Ho Yi Fan chooses to move his queen back to f6, which is a safer square at the moment. But now we can see queen takes f6 and it is no longer about d5 pawn that is weak. We have three more weaknesses that we can target on, namely the a6, f6 and h6 square, all ready for all this rook and the bishop to attack on. Of course this knight can join the forces as well. Maxime Vachelograph continues with rook to c5, already attacking d5 pawn. After rook to c8, of course, we don't trade our powerful piece. Rook to c3, rook to b1. Ho Yifan can continue to shuffle her pieces around, but there's no way he can protect all this pawn 
all these weak pawns at once, or so to speak, four weaknesses at once. She tries to pull a magical defense, but in the end, all pawns left the board, and, you know, in this position, being down a couple of pawns, on top of the fact that you're actually dealing with top grandmasters in the world, there's no, you know, saving it, you know? And just in this position, Holy Fan chose to resign. Main reason is that White can actually play King F2, King E2, and again, he's in the square to stop the pawn from promotion. After B4, King E2, he's inside the square um, to stop the pawn from promotion. If you haven't seen the endgame course or the endgame playlist that I made, check it out in the playlist down in the description below as well. But in essence, there's no way that Black can actually uh, successfully escort his pawn to promotion. While White has free or more advantage on the king's side, he can push and make his own queen. So this position is losing for Hui Fan, that's why she resigned. But I'll tell you what, it is very possible to win with black after pawn to h6. After all, this is the most famous response after bishop takes on g5, which is nowadays considered just dubious. The point is, after bishop takes e7 and queen takes e7, you want to attack on the queen side faster than lightning ever could strike. Again, pawn to a6, pawn c5, pawn to b5, the bishop coming out. Hui Fan really does well in showing us how to attack on the queen side. However, if you remember, she plays into a blunder that looks logical with rook to b8. She should have gone queen takes b2 attacking the knight, and let's say after the queen takes on b6, we can take on a3, everything will be fine, and the game goes on probably. I'll bet with black having to defend this weak pawn on a6 and also d5. In this game, Mariam Buzichuk, one of the strongest grandmasters from Ukraine, plays queen to d2, and Elena plays the best continuation black could go for in this variation, with her focusing everything that she has on the queen side. Now after rook to e1, bishop to d3, g4, we see both sides pushing each other's pawn down to the throat of the opponent's flank. But in the end, when it's required for Maria to actually blow up the center, excuse me, the king's side of the board, pawn to h6, rook to g1 of some sort, she does play knight to g3 and knight to h5. This move is not really useful, um, it's attacking g7, but after g6, the knight is forced to move to f6, and Elena here brilliantly plays pawn to h5 to lock up any prospect on the king's side of the board. And suddenly, what is slightly worse, due to the fact that everything is locked up and it's counter plays no more. Now black continues to bring all these pieces to the queen side, while in general white is just trying to exchange more pieces so that she can reach the end game pretty quickly. Elena has no problem for that and continues to play actively on the queen side, removing all these active pieces and bringing all these major pieces and heavy pieces onto this file to attack the king. Not mentioning the knight can actually jump in pretty quickly with this pawn trying to break up the pawn chain on the queen side. And the game continues with white trying to fend off everything on the queen side, especially the pressure on the queen side of the c file. But black's always one step ahead in attacking all this pawn chain, the base pawn. And in the end, even after um, this particular variation, let's say, we don't have to have a deep analysis to see that black has all these pieces attacking the base pawn, while white is having none of these pieces nearing any of this base pawn from black. So of course black's already better from here, but how to continue? White continues to rook to a8, um, going to the background attacking black's base pawn, but after that, knight takes h4, and after rook to b8 check, um, we can see everything is about too late, when two of the pass pawn from black can restart really pushing to make a queen. In this particular variation and continuation, white just resigned. Black's just too fast, and all this pawn be stopped once black promotes his pawns to queen. And so really, the opening is amazing in the fact that um, not a lot of people know this just yet, so you can actually use this as a surprise factor to actually trap your opponent, you know, to just make a blunder and to make mistakes in general. But more than that, even if they know how to counter this opening pretty well, um, they know the concept, you can still get a game going on, and I promise it will not be a boring one after both sides push all of his pawns to checkmate, you know, the opponent of the other, on the other flank. But in general, I revise um, the opening a little bit with pawn to f4, Playing knight to f3, knight pawn to g4 quickly, king to f2, forgetting about castling, bring the rook over um, to basically again just checkmate black quickly as possible. I revised that in the theory last week. So far, no one um, or no one in the top level has played like that, but it should be interesting um, to follow up on just because the sole reason of the very fourth game that we just saw just now that we can't let the pawn on black side march up too far and too fast. We have to create our own kind of play as well. But that's all about the review of the games. Um, hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully you learned something on this French defense a la kind shot of variation. In any case, if you want to find um, an opponent to spar, my link to Lee Chess ID is always below. And so you can have a look on that.
Otherwise, if you like this video, if you learned something, please consider pressing like button. I would appreciate it a lot. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.